Let us uh, begin, please. Uh, I know a great many of you, but I'm delighted to see some faces that I at least think I don't know, uh, as I had hoped that uh, we would have a nice turnout today for, uh, for remembering Bob Stern, who, uh, boy, have I learned in the last few weeks how many people uh, loved Bob and respected Bob and value, I just, and, and are indebted to Bob for many of the, the things that he did uh, for, for other people. Uh, so thank you all for coming. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, let, now, we scheduled this event for today uh, precisely because uh, Everett and Caroline Stern, uh, Bob's kids, not really kids anymore, uh, we're going to be in town, uh, coincidentally, for, I believe, a wedding, right? That's me. Thank you. Oh, well, <laughs> you're the newlyweds? Rachel's Oh, wonderful. Okay. Uh, so because of that, they were going to be in town, and, uh, and putting it on today meant that they could both attend. Actually, Caroline had to uh, change her flight back in order to do it today because Everett uh, couldn't do it yesterday. Then, as it turns out, unfortunately, Everett hasn't been able to attend. Uh, he had a medical issue that uh, kept him from flying. So he's not with us today, even though that had been the plan. And I don't know whether he's watching. We are streaming this event live, uh, so I'm hoping that he is watching. And if so, hi, uh, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, and uh, f f of course, you're here, so you don't need to do that. But you may want to relive the experience. We will. We are recording it, uh, and we'll be posting it on the Ford School website, where you can go look at it over and over again uh, if you want. Um, because of that, uh, various people are going to be speaking. Uh, when you do speak, I'm going to need you to come up here and stand more or less where I am, so because this is the microphone uh, that's capturing this all for both the streaming and for for the uh, and for the recording of it. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, now let me tell you what we plan to do here. Uh, we have four videos, short videos, from various people who want, are remembering uh, Bob. Three of them from other countries, people who couldn't make it uh, to come in person. Uh, and therefore recorded videos uh, that they sent. One of them uh, actually arrived from India within the last hour uh, from Rajesh, for those who, who know him and his family. So we'll be seeing those things. Uh, there are several of you that who told me at some point that you would speak, and I'll be calling on you to do that. I hope you remember that you said you were going to do that. Uh, uh, there will also be a, a few uh, cases of reading things that people wrote and sent in, I think maybe three of those things. Uh, so we'll go through all of those things and then when we're done, uh, we'll ask anybody else who's here and would like to stand up and say anything uh, to do so. And that will be it. And then uh, we have ordered some very light refreshments uh, that I don't know if they're out there yet, but they will be out in what we call the Great Hall right outside this room. Uh, and so when we're done in here, you can stand around and drink and eat and talk to each other. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'm inviting any or all of you to join us for dinner uh, at the Gourmet Garden Chinese Restaurant. Uh, this was actually, although he may not see it that way. This was Ev's idea. When we talked about what we might do, he says, well, we could get together at a Chinese restaurant because Bob always liked Chinese. Uh, in fact, he always liked in particular uh, one Chinese restaurant. Why aren't we going there? Because it went out of business, unfortunately, the, the Middle Kingdom. So. Uh, I, 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 we're going to the Gourmet Garden, which I've liked. Uh, I have no idea whether Bob uh, would, would like it, but that's the idea. So anybody who wants to, to join us there afterwards, please do. Uh, it is Dutch treat. Uh, I don't know if the younger people know what that means, but the, many of us do. In, in other words, you're paying your own way. I'm not buying your dinner. Uh, but I would be more than happy to sit with you and, and talk with you if you choose to come, which I hope many of you will. Um, yeah. Okay, we, we do have enough things to do here that, I, 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 and I better set an example here, we need to keep our remarks relatively brief or we're going to go on all night. Uh, so please keep it down to just, uh, you know, three minutes or something like that if you can. Now, it would be appropriate presumably for me to start with some of my recollections. Uh, did, did I say this? I'm Alan Deerdorf. Uh, if I didn't mention that, I should. Uh, and Bob and I worked together for 
uh, most of my career and a pretty fair portion of his career. Uh, and, and that's, in some sense, the, the reason I'm doing this. But frankly, uh, it's much more than just that we work together. Uh, there is no person in the world, has been no person in the world, uh, more important to my professional life than Bob Stern. Uh, he hired me. Uh, I kind of believe against the will of some of his colleagues, but uh, <laughs> some of them are here and could perhaps comment on that. <laughs> but that's, that's not what we're here about. But anyway, he, he, he hired me. Uh, he, he mentored me, took care of me kind of when I was an assistant professor. In fact, uh, the very first thing he did was when he learned what the associate uh, chair of economics at the time had assigned me to teach, he says, no, that won't do, that's too much. Uh, and he went to John Cross and said, no, absolutely, he's not going to teach both 401 and 402. Give him two sections of something, 402, I think, which is why I became a macroeconomist. Uh, so, so he was looking out for me from the very beginning. He would read my work, give me feedback on it, never told me what to do at all, uh, and never, I, in my recollection, suggested that we work together or co-author things until after I was promoted. Uh, Another thing, which I'm pretty sure wouldn't have happened without his uh, role, but again, nobody will tell me what was said in that meeting. Um, so, so he was very much responsible for all, all of that. And then after I was promoted, he and I started again at his initiative to work together on this, that, and the other thing, and ended up uh, building what a model, the Michigan model, uh, which we use for all sorts of purposes, and uh, what got to travel around the world, often together. Uh, very early on, uh, he and I would fly together, and I have, would insist on the smoking section, because I smoked. He didn't. On the other hand, he was married to Lucetta, who did. Uh, uh, I'm just relieved that, although, that he lived a long, uh, oh, Giuseppe, welcome. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Didn't expect you. Uh, Giuseppe comes to us all the way from Italy just for this event, right? Yeah, well, sort of. <laughs> sort of. Um, anyway, uh, as far as I know, the secondhand smoke from me and from Lucetta were, were not harmful to Bob, but one could imagine that they might have been. Uh, and so then we worked together and published together for, for uh, as I say, for all of my career uh, until, what, it was just five years ago, Bob had long since retired formally from the uh, economics department and from the Ford School, but he continued to teach in the Ford School. Most of you probably know this. A uh, very successful uh, pair of seminars that he would do. Uh, students were very disappointed when he uh, didn't return from California. He went out to California just to escape the ice, I think, and to be close to his daughter. I'm sure, and, and his grandson, right? Yeah, uh, but uh, ended up staying out there. I, it's a mystery to those of us back here why he would prefer California, but he did. Uh, and so, but then he managed to get set up so that he could teach those same seminars at the policy school at Berkeley, uh, which he did, I believe, until last fall, right? So, uh, man, this is, what an energetic go get em guy. I mean, you, you saw him running across campus constantly, right? Well, actually, no. Uh, physically, he was, uh, and increasingly so in his later years, uh, unable to move around a great deal. Uh, he needed help, and he got a lot of help from people who were here, uh, for which we can all be thankful. Uh, and he managed, as you'll be hearing later on, to continue to travel, even when it must have been extremely difficult for him uh, and for various purposes. So uh, there's nobody in the world, that, uh, especially outside of my immediate family, that I would want to honor uh, more than Bob Stern. And so that's why, uh, from my point of view, that's why we're doing this. Uh, let me turn then to the things that we have scheduled here. And... Hello. Is, why does it look like that? Uh, can you get it to the other presentation? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're get, by the way, with this thing, whole event could never have happened. Of course, it has, remains to be seen how well it's going to happen without the help <laughs> of Cliff here and Chris, who may be back there, and Aaron did some stuff, and others, Laura's group. Uh, we, we had a lot of help from people in Ford School. Okay, here we go, the gathering. Uh, and our first video is from Philip Abraham. As you see, he got his PhD in 87 and was a Stern student. 
Uh, all right. Oh, of course, I have to hit that button. There we go. Hello, I'm Philip Abraham, and I'm joining from a rainy day in Belgium uh, to remember Bob Stern, who has meant a lot for me and, and my family. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Bob studied together with my father at Columbia, and so we were family friends even before I came to do my PhD at the University of Michigan. My first meeting with Bob was actually when I was 13 years old, when I was invited to come to his place, and he took me to Cape Cod. And one thing I do remember was that he invited me also to a Red Sox baseball game, which for me as a European soccer fanatic was the first experience with another sport in the US. My fondest memories, however, were uh, linked to the years I spent uh, together with my wife Hilde uh, as a PhD student in Ann Arbor. Uh, we agree that uh, those days were some of the best that we have had in our life and Bob was a full a part of making this possible for us. One of the things that he helped us to do was logistical support. As a matter of fact, from Lucetta and Bob we got uh, some very yellow um, Plate, uh, yellow plates and other useful things that we could uh, not afford as graduate students. Um, social support also very important. Yeah, and Seta and Bobby invited us several times to their home and, and that was always very nice and I have very good memories about this. Professional support, um, for sure. Um, Bob and Alan hired me as a research assistant in my second year of graduate school uh, to work on this famous Michigan model like so many of uh, the former PhD students. Uh, Bob helped me in, in all possible ways. Uh, he really made it possible for me to, to do my PhD. Uh, he corrected me and he got me back on track when things were not going that well. Um, he also, and that I liked a lot about, he was always very clear in what he expected from PhD students and from myself. Uh, it was not the easy way, you had to perform and, and this is also what I always try to convey later on to my own PhD students. And, and finally, what he did in his very implicit and, and nice way was making clear what my strengths were, that's nice, but also what my weaknesses were. And that helped me a lot during my professional career. When I got back from um, Ann Arbor and returned to my um, country, uh, Belgium, where I became a professor at the uh, uh, University of Leuven, um, he helped, we always kept in touch. Uh, um, we, I, I visited him several times in Ann Arbor. He came several times to Leuven to give seminars and to meet the family. And those were always very nice uh, moments. So I, I, when I heard that he um, had deceased, uh, well then of course it, it did something to me. And not only to me, but my whole family. Uh, my father um, who is also now um, uh, in hospital at this moment. Uh, wanted to express his uh, deepest sympathy to Carol Everett and the whole family, uh, my brother who spent also several years doing his PhD in an art, but not in economics, um, sends its regards and of my, my wife Hilde um, also wanted to um, uh, mention that uh, Bob and Vesetta meant a lot for her as well. So uh, I hope that the uh, remembrance service um, goes on and that we all can have very fond memories of what Bob achieved and what a very nice person he was. Thank you very much. Guess what? You're up, Dave. Oh. <laughs> Dave Richardson knows Mel Levitsky. I didn't know that. We were office mates in the 30s. We smoked people. Of course you would. Oh, I'm forgetting that he had this he dark period in his life when he was at the university. He taught me oh. the definition of economics. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dave is going to share his memories. I'll let you introduce yourself and explain your. <clears throat> I'm Dave Richardson. I'm retired now, and I was a Michigan graduate student in the late 1960s. Uh, Bob came to Michigan in the early 1960s, so I was one of his uh, group from the late 1960s. During that time, I co-authored, and I authored many things uh, with Bob and for Bob. Uh, but I got a job at the University of Wisconsin, and I had an equally magical mentor in Robert Baldwin. And those of us who knew both Bobs call them often the two Bobs. And later on, I'll give you Bob Baldwin's opinion of Bob Stern, which was warm and wonderful. 
Bob Stern and I had a serious falling out, however, in the 1990s. Caroline probably knows that there was a, an iron resistance part of Bob that uh, in professional circles was usually very well taken. And uh, in our case, it was unresolved. But when I retired institutionally at the end of 2012, uh, after a period of pretty much silence between Bob and me for 15 years, Bob flew from Berkeley to Washington um, with his health aid, paid for both as far as I know, and attended the reception, the uh, retirement reception party that we had there and gave wonderful and warm remarks about me Without his saying so, that blew me away because he was offering to me uh, a kind of peace offering. Let's make up again by doing so dramatic a thing for me. So I'm deeply appreciative and I'm deeply sorry, Caroline, for you. And my m remarks today are, in a sense, partly posthumous reciprocity for what Bob did for me, not just in the early days that I'll tell you about a little bit more, but in that final retirement uh, celebration. Um, what I'll tell you about early in my career was a wise intervention by Bob. Bob had many wise interventions with many of us, and the one with me, I think, illustrates some of his professional strengths that I wish more of us had these days. Now, if Bob were here, he might say it was a cunning intervention on his part, not just a wise one. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I'll bet it was. But it illustrates Bob simultaneously in his two persona. Bob had one persona that you could call friendly counselor. I think Lucetta probably helped him with the friendly counselor persona. And his other personas was he was a Delphic professional seer. More than even Bob Baldwin, my colleague at Wisconsin, Bob Stern, I think had a sense of judgment about what was important and coming to be important in the profession that he never quite could articulate except when there was a decision to be made regarding a paper or a conference or uh, one of his students. And he also, in that Delphic professional strength that he had, could identify who could do the important work that needed to be done. Let me tell you, therefore, the early story in which I was the beneficiary of him making a judgment over important work to be done and who could do it. Here's the old story from the late 1960s when I almost dropped out of graduate school for financial reasons. And Bob Stern saved me, literally. Michigan Department of the late 1960s, as several of you in the audience know, was tough, it was young, and it was on the make. And grad students felt more than the usual grad student pressures in the late 1960s here at Michigan. I almost failed out of Saul Hyman's first year mi micro class. B minus Saul, you would not remember that. That's <laughs> the barest of passes. Oh. And at that time, we wrote comprehensive exams at the end of first year in theory and at the end of second year in the two fields, two fields, not just one field, two fields that we represented. So courses and comps, courses and comps, courses and comps in a young department on the make. It was pretty brutal. Pressures were so intense that three of us out of a cohort of about 25 had unexpected babies. <laughs> Nine months after the second year set of comps. 
we were serious. And I know in two of the three cases, my own included, um, we were taking all the necessary precautions. We were rational actors, remember. We we're graduate student economists. So how this happened, the three out of 25, I have no idea. But my wife's and my plans for uh, financial support during my third and fourth and fifth year of grad school were shattered, completely shattered. My wife is a graduate of the library school here. She graduated from the library school and had our baby two weeks later. But someone had to work to take care of the baby. It had to be her or me. It turned out to be me as it turned out. But looking at this from the perspective of the second summer after graduate school, I was at one of the lowest points ever in my life. I was discouraged, I was depressed. I thought now I needed to provide for the family and leave graduate school, get a job somehow, um, because this was, remember, the late 60s. We hadn't thought about the idea of house husbands yet. So I visited Bob Stern early in third year to ask if there was any advice he could give me, any wisdom he could give me, any job leads he could give me outside of academics and graduate school and to share with him how I felt and apologize to him for, in a sense, failing at the task. Um, mm, mm, mm. Bob Stern had a good way of musing. He didn't use mmm, but you could tell he was thinking mmm. And in his usual serious way, in sort of always kind of inquisitive way, with eyes not quite open, but always twinkling through the eyelids, you know the Bob Stern look. You're going to see it on the videos we have. He said, well, I do have a project that Maybe you could be funded for if you get permission from the Canada Council that was otherwise supporting me, but at a pretty low level. Today we'd call that project a robustness analysis or a sensitivity check. That's the modern way of thinking about the project he had for me. Uh, and it had to do with one of the techniques that Bob Stern and Ed Lemer included in their path-breaking book called Quantitative International Economics. I thought the project was pedestrian because it involved huge data collection, all kinds of running regressions when regressions were run using punch cards and going up to North University Avenue with the punch cards. And in my arrogant grad student way, I had better things to do, I thought, but hey, Expectant fathers who are penny poor can't be complainers. So I said yes to this pedestrian project with no theory, I said at the time. And I spent my third year of graduate school solvent, but more pressured than ever. I was doing Brad's, Bob's project for our baby's sake. I was pursuing my own dissertation on the theory, the theory of foreign direct investment. And I emphasize that to show how stupid I was, and you'll hear more stupidity to come. And learning reluctantly how to be a father. I think Bob, in his cunning way, knew far better than I what I was cut out for professionally. And I think Bob kind of welcomed this change in life for me and my wife, as an opportunity to set me more on the right path. This massive big data project in the days before there were big data projects actually suited my talents as Bob saw them. He had the skill, I think, of seeing that very well. So imagine Bob's consternation one year after our conversation at the beginning of my fourth year, when it begins by my walking in with a finished final project report, and I told them I was eternally grateful 
for the family support that he'd offered me for the child support. And now in my fourth year, I had to get to work on my dissertation so uh, as to be proud of myself and that he would be proud of me. So Bob took the project report at the beginning of my fourth year, spent two weeks going over it, called me back in and said something like the following. This is really fine work, masterful. Would you consider using it as your doctoral dissertation? Sure, I thought, eh, I don't want to be known for this. I know I thought that. And I said, no, I don't think so, Bob, but thank you so much. <laughs> It really was so pedestrian. I really appreciate it, thanks. Picture Bob flabbergasted. He just offered a dissertation to someone who turned it down. Speechless, Bob was speechless. He just sat there. He was completely perplexed. He never expressed any anger. We parted, I went home, and my wife, who found Bob Stern to be one of the few gentlemen among male economists that she knew at that time and ever since, <laughs> <laughs> my wife said, what did you say? <laughs> what did you say to Bob? You turned Bob down? What? And the end of the story is uh, that arrogant graduate student reconsidered his arrogance. And I accepted Bob's judgment. That was the most important thing. And I accepted Bob's offer. And that baby birth project led to three high quality publications and my vaunted, exalted theory of foreign direct investment led to much lower quality publications. They both led to publications. And the great moral of that story as I see it is that Bob Stern cared deeply, deeply for his students at the same time as he cared deeply, deeply for important professional creativity and to have both of those things in the same man as a graduate student is not just rare, but it's miraculous and marvelous. And to this day, I am eternally thankful for Bob's overruling support and judgment in my own career. Thank you. Next, I want to uh, read you uh, something that another student of Bob's sent in. Uh, this is from Peter DeBear. Uh, he got his PhD in 1998, uh, and he's now an associate professor at the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. Uh, and as you'll see, he's been close to Bob in, in various ways. Uh, so this is what he said. It was mid-January, and I received a parcel of books from Bob, and he's talking about this year, uh, on my last visit, we had been talking about how I might edit a book on the economics of water, and Bob sent me a few samples of the many books he had edited. He probably had been cleaning out his shelves. It was the last installment in a generous stream of advice and suggestions that started when I met Bob in 1994, during my second year in, of my PhD studies in Ann Arbor. Over the years, his messages had ranged from articles he'd read to documentaries he'd seen. One of his favorite documentaries was Looking for Sugar Man, a DVD about the Detroit singer who, unbeknownst to himself, had become a rock star in South Africa during the times of anti-apartheid's embargo that had isolated the country from the rest of the world. I remember that. I might even have seen it with Bob, perhaps. <laughs> uh, international trade, indeed, uh, Peter says, was always lurking around the corner. When I learned of Bob's passing, I did not quite know what to do, so I went online and Googled his name. I came across his essay, My Studies in International Economics. Some of you may have seen that. 
It is, as you would expect, knowing Bob, very much no-nonsense and unsentimental. It did contain a few things that I had forgotten or may never have known. Bob actually did not start out as an economist. At Berkeley, his first academic steps were in studying languages, Spanish in particular. Before embarking on a PhD, he also obtained an MBA from Chicago. I must have known that, but I didn't remember it. Uh, with a focus on accounting. This, together with his experience working as a civilian auditor in occupied Japan. Really? Uh, did he, maybe this was fiction. Uh, as, as he wrote himself, built or established his phenomenal organizational skills. These account for an endless list of workshops, conferences, and symposia with his signature, and that I certainly do know. Uh, those same skills also made it possible that he, barely able to walk, would still travel the world until a few years ago. They also made him move around effortlessly from his blue house in Oakland to the Jewish movie club in Berkeley that he attended on a weekly basis, or to the United Artists Cinema in Shattuck, uh, the Bistro Liaison, the Trattoria Corso, and the coffee houses where he would meet during uh, my visiting UC Berkeley in the spring of 2012. In the essay, I also learned about Bob's father's involvement in the meatpacking business and how visiting slaughterhouses while, supplying, while studying at Chicago convinced them that he'd have to do nothing to do with meatpacking and pursue a career in academia. This rang true. Bob had an intense distaste for things loud and violent, which I always associated with what characterized him best. In a world of decibels and exclamation marks, he was soft-spoken, and made noise without raising his voice, but with the generosity of his mind and the hospitality of his home. We will miss him. Peter. And I didn't push the button here. Uh-oh. I'm not able to move forward. <clears throat> Well, that does it. Can you go to the next one then? There we go. As long as you're there, why don't you click on them? Here's a video from three of Bob's students. He has many more in Seoul, Korea, uh, but three of them were able to get together. Hello. Hello. My name is Luke Chen. Uh, I graduated uh, from the University of Michigan in uh, 1990, specialized in international trade. Uh, even though uh, I was not uh, taught by him, uh, he continued to give me uh, the various helpful uh, advices in uh, the seminar class uh, before I graduated there. So uh, I was so sad to hear about uh, his death, and I uh, mourned uh, with my whole heart uh, uh, of his death, and uh, I'd like to provide uh, the offer very sincere condolences to his family and to uh, Professor Theodore, who, who must be uh, one of the closest colleagues. Thank you. Uh, hi, Alan, and uh, all my friends. Um, my name is Chol Chong. Uh, I graduated in 2002. Um, Bob was a uh, uh, terrific uh, researcher and teacher, and excellent person. Uh, I remember one day in 1997, when I was taking his uh, uh, seminar class. Uh, it was his moving day, and that day, uh, Michigan football team uh, beat Penn State uh, 37 to nothing, and eventually went on to win uh, the national championship. Uh, my memory about Bob is like that. It's very uh, fun and uh, pleasant. He has been always uh, nice, and I miss him a lot. And my heart is with you. Hi. Hello, uh, my name is Dokun Tan. Uh, I graduated uh, Economics Department in 1996 uh, under the guidance of Professor Stern and uh, Theodor. Um, now I'm teaching at Seoul National University, uh, Graduate School of International Studies. Uh, when I was a PhD student there, uh, we were immensely benefited by academic leadership of Professor uh, Stern. Uh, he and Professor uh, Theodore organized an uh, amazing academic conference for international economics every year at that time. Uh, 
uh, by inviting numerous uh, renowned scholars. Um, so we could always keep abreast of the frontier knowledge and insights uh, of the field. Uh, later he published uh, all those academic outcomes uh, in the book. Uh, now uh, my student, so his grand students, are learning from uh, those books. So uh, we are very grateful to his second leadership. Uh, actually, I'm uh, publishing a book under a word scientific publishing. Uh, he recently launched. Um, I was planning to send the first copy to him uh, for thanking him for all those help and assistance throughout my academic career. Uh, so I feel very sorry for uh, losing that chance. So instead, I'm sending this message to him as well as his family and friends up there. Thank you. Okay, uh, Barbara Bach. I'm sorry, I should have let everybody know the order of things. I have it here, but I, I don't divulge it. This is a little extemporaneous. I'm Barbara Bach, I've been a family friend since 1968 when I moved here. So I don't bring the academic credentials nor the language, I'm so sorry. But I do want to just bring a little bit of my remembrances as the family man. <clears throat> I would say for about 20 years as a single parent, um, both the Stearns and myself shared Thanksgiving and Christmas Eve and Christmas breakfast and one of the special memories I have are some young people behind Carolyn doing um, charades at a very young age with a lot of vocabulary understanding. I'm sure it was because they lived in the Stern family or they were associated with the Stern family. The other one is the wonderful picture I have of Bob in Wellfleet in a I don't remember whether it was a rocking chair or it was just a special chair. And there were papers. And the papers were theses and conference papers. And Lucetta and I would play tennis and come home and he was happy as a clam. Well, no, not a clam. He, was, he looked very happy in the position of reading a lot, a lot of wonderful um, economic uh, dissertations and things. The other and the last one, of course, is that wonderful picture with the white beard and the white um, hair. He was Santa Claus on Christmas Eve and the best Santa Claus of all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dave, your turn again. He's going to read something that Bob Baldwin said, uh, a portion of what Bob said. Uh, at the Festschrift conference that was held in honor uh, of Bob some years ago. You probably know. Uh, in 1997. Um, By the uh, microphone. Yes. And uh, this uh, portrait of Bob Stern by Bob Baldwin is both accurate and shows you, I think, Bob Stern's uniqueness uh, in the profession. Uh, so this is all Bob Baldwin's voice. To begin, let me express what a happy and joyous occasion this is, 1997, the Festschrift volume. It's published, by the way, in that volume. We've come together to honor Bob Stern, not just an economist, but as a friend. Many of the individuals who gain fame in the professional fields are often not the most admirable individuals on the personal level. Gaining fame is not an easy task, and many individuals who succeed are rather uh, self-centered in the sense of letting others know how frequently, how important and original their own writings are in, win in winning the race to fame. With Bob Stern, we have a completely different picture. Here's a person who's gained fame as an economist and at the same time is warmly admired as a person. 
I remember that Leontief always felt that one of the highest forms of praise he could give anyone was to say that he was a straight shooter. To my mind, this description fits Bob very well. When Bob tells you what he thinks about some idea or some person, you know that's what he's telling everyone. He doesn't play games in order to make a point or to put someone down, nor does he try to elicit some remark about how great a scholar he is. You also know that your friendship with Bob is not something he's going to use for some self-serving purpose or just as a way of meeting other people who can be beneficial to his career. It's a friendship you can count on for life. Now let me move away from Bob's accomplishments. There's two pages of accomplishments in here. Through his writings and discuss another important feature of his career, namely his ability to attract an extraordinarily talented group of graduate students. He's done this consistently over 30 years and how extraordinary this accomplishment is. He thinks that Jagdish Bagwadi is the only rival to Bob Stern. I, Bob Baldwin, have always been rather envious of Bob on this point. Dave Richardson and I have had a number of good students who've gone on to distinguished academic careers, but nothing like Bob has had. My claim to fame in terms of producing other economists has been achieved the old-fashioned way through procreation and arranging marriages. A lot of Baldwin's kids are economists and married to economists. I began to think about just how Bob Stern might have succeeded at this remarkable feat. Hmm, maybe he gets those good students because he's so kind and considerate to them and thus they become attached to him in his field. He has a kind of friendly, grandfatherly quality. Perhaps he invites them over to their house and serves up one of his nice buffets and lets Lucetta talk to them and ease their personal problems. Well, maybe. Still another hypothesis I thought about is that perhaps he charms them with his unique personality. Well, perhaps. What is the secret of attracting so many top-notch graduate students? Well, after talking to several of them, I think I figured it out. Bob has followed what I would call the big-time football model. He must have become familiar with it over the many years he had at Michigan. Coaches go out and recruit their players. And that's what Bob seems to do. He identifies the top graduate students, not just those who have wandered into trade, but those in other fields. Ed Lemer was recruited. But how is successful recruitment done? Well, first of all, you've got to have some scholarships to attract your recruits. And this is where the Stern Deerdorf Research Department. Bob is not an envious man, by the way, making these comments, but he was envious at this point. Comes into play. Those two guys, Stern and Deerdorf, have used Bob's MBA knowledge to put together a highly efficient, smooth research operation that must be the envy of many private research firms. They put out first rate research proposals. I know this from personal experience and competing against them. And they found places to tap for research funds that I haven't even heard about. Bob Baldwin would be embarrassed at my theatrical rendering, but this is, I'm just reading the words here. But successful recruiting is much more than having attractive scholarship. A key question in the mind of a recruit is whether the particular team he joins will be useful in helping him to get into the pros after he or she completes his or her college career. And Bob Stern is especially helpful on that point. And he goes on to illustrate. None of the rest of us has come close to operating such an organization as the Michigan Research Machine. <laughs> so I hope I have reminded you of some of the many ways in which Bob Stern is an extraordinary individual. His administrative ability, his unflappability, his ability to persuade you to present a paper at one of his conferences even though you're already overcommitted. I must say how wonderful it is to know Bob and wish him and Lucetta 
continued success and happiness in the rest of their professional careers and personal lives. Thank you. That reminds me of another feature of my uh, collaboration with Bob over the years, which is quite often uh, others would give credit to Deerdorf and Stern as though we had done them things equally. Uh, but in many cases that wasn't true, and it certainly wasn't true here. I never got a grant in my life. I never even tried. Uh, Bob is always the one that raised the money, uh, always. I wouldn't know how. Uh, and thank goodness I didn't have to. Um, okay, next, uh, I see I neglected once again to uh, advance this, but the next one is a video from Keith Maskus. I didn't do this to the others and I apologize for that, but I better let you know what's coming. Uh, video from Keith Maskus, then Marina, there you are, uh, you're gonna speak a little bit. Uh, then I'm going to read some remarks from Bernard Hochman, and then we got a video from Rajesh Chada and his family, and the final speaker before we open it up will be Barbara Peitch, which, uh, there you are. Okay, I knew you came in. I, yeah, good. Okay, so here we have Keith Maskus, which he thinks I'm not going to manage it, but I'll bet I can. Everyone? Oh, but you're going to check. Uh, hi, everybody. This is Keith Maskus out in Boulder, Colorado. Sorry I can't be there to join you uh, and help thank and remember Bob Stern and all he did for all of us. I'd just like to spend a few minutes uh, telling a couple stories and then finishing up. Uh, Bob was uh, instrumental in uh, my whole decision to study international trade. I actually went to Michigan many, many years ago to become a development economist. Uh, that didn't really take for me, uh, but looking around, I saw this guy, Bob Stern, who was traveling around the world all the time, and that's really was uh, attractive to me, so I started talking to him about this kind of a career, and he rewarded me with a pretty tedious research assistantship, but uh, it was worth doing, finding all of that data in the library and putting it all into punch cards, uh, because that turned out to be uh, my first uh, strong publication, joint with Bob, way back in 1981. It really got me started on my career. Um, and Bob also was uh, really good about uh, motivation. He gave me some gentle motivation to finish my dissertation a few years into my time at Michigan when I told him that my undergraduate college, which I really didn't want to go back and teach at, was offering me a job before I finish, and his answer was, well, you could do worse. So uh, I thought I'd better uh, try to get on with my uh, dissertation at that time. Let me just mention a few characteristics Bob had that I thought were really fantastic. Uh, one was in his incredible uh, set of connections and his ability to get famous and interesting people to come to Ann Arbor and talk. I was always uh, blown away by these people he'd get from uh, Washington, USTR, Commerce, and everyone else, in addition to all of the famous trade economists. So uh, that, to me, was uh, a real attraction to studying international trade. And an ability that he had to write uh, insightful papers at the last minute, convincing me that maybe I didn't have to do everything right on time. Bob had a mysterious but unfailing intuition about which students would do well at which tasks, and I think we all benefited from that very much. Uh, he had a real dedication to getting uh, the work of his students circulated and presented to help launch their careers. Uh, I was certainly a very direct beneficiary of that, presenting my work at uh, the Bureau and at uh, the AEA meetings and, and many other places. He had an unfailing commitment throughout his professional life to uh, engage in new subjects and encourage others to think and write about uh, additional things, new areas, uh, and, and of course, along with Alan, really really built a, a program in international trade at Michigan, which was uh, very, very innovative uh, and important. Uh, so I think uh, Bob's got a lasting legacy. His students and grand students, and so, including some of my own you know, students who are very well established in the profession, they're everywhere, they're making big impacts. Uh, and it's really amazing to think about how many successful trade and development economists went through Michigan uh, or others who had been earlier through Michigan uh, with, uh, with his direct or indirect guidance. Um, so, as I said for me personally, there are several of my own students who are, are now quite successful, all of them using techniques that uh, Bob or Alan or both uh, put together and we tried to popularize. So, uh, definitely a lasting legacy. Let me just uh, finish by saying I am personally honored uh, that I've been asked by World Scientific to continue Bob's uh, work as editor of their series in international economics. I'm looking forward to doing that and keeping Bob's uh, fantastic program going there. 
So finally, let me just uh, give you my best wishes to all of Bob's family and friends there and colleagues in Ann Arbor. Uh, he will be missed, uh, not only there, but, uh, but around the world. So thank you, and uh, good luck on the, uh, on the remembrance. The uh, World Scientific Company, I, I, as soon as I, almost as soon as I heard about Bob's death, I uh, contacted them, I know them, and uh, told them about it, and they were, of course, very uh, unhappy to hear it. So uh, they sent along a couple of slides. I think this one uh, is the most important one, uh, just conveying their sympathy. But uh, backing up, there's uh, an example of some of the books he, he has edited uh, as, the, as the series editor, uh, I don't know, I think several dozen uh, of these volumes uh, in, through World Scientific, and it's really playing quite a role. Okay, uh, Marina. Thank you, Alan. I first met Bob Stern somewhere between 40 and 50 years ago um, when I was teaching at the University of Pittsburgh and Bob invited me, uh, me as a young uh, economist and an even more junior colleague of mine to come and give a paper in his seminar. And uh, I have no recollection of what the paper was about. But I do remember two things from that seminar. One was that it was in the old economics building, which I think burned down shortly thereafter. And um, it had been, Bob's seminar was in the basement. And it had been raining quite hard in Ann Arbor for the preceding few days. And I remember that my feet got very wet because the building <laughs> leaked so badly. Um, I, I know that a lot of people lost valuable work in that fire, but I must say as far as the building was concerned, possibly its time had come. And the other thing I remember is thinking what a terrific guy this Bob Stern was, and I hope that sometime I could be as effective a teacher, particularly in that kind of Socratic method that one uses in a seminar, as he was. And I'm not sure that I ever made, quite made it, but it was a nice um, goal to aim at. And one way I have emulated Bob is that, like him, I just couldn't seem to get the hang of retirement, and I've gone on teaching uh, long, before, long after any sensible person would have retired. I don't know if I'll ever quite match Bob's record, but uh, I certainly am, have followed in his footsteps in that respect. I was never formally taught by Bob Stern. I got my undergraduate uh, degree at Harvard and my graduate degree at Columbia, but in an informal sense, he may have been my most important teacher because he wrote a book called The Balance of Payments. He told me it actually was one of his less successful books. Well, maybe so, but that book absolutely revolutionized my approach to uh, teaching international trade and finance. And even beyond that, uh, when I became the chief economist of General Motors, I forced my, my staff to do forecasting and analysis um, as if the United States were an open economy and not simply a closed one. Uh, that wasn't enough to save General Motors from its <laughs> ultimate fate because met many of the very senior executives didn't really take to heart what I said, but at least I tried and that was also due to the enlightenment that I got from Bob Stern. All in all, Bob Stern was, in one person, a quintessential teacher, scholar, and gentleman. 
the world won't see his like again, I'm convinced. And uh, it's with great sadness that I contemplate the fact that he's no longer with us. Okay, I want to read you, it's a short message from Bernard Hochmann. Uh, here we go. Uh, I think I just got it today from him. Hi, Alan. Sorry I can't be there and afraid of video is not my cup of tea. As you know, Bob had a great impact on me. I would not be where I am today if it had not been for him offering me an RA slot and it being conditional on switching into the PhD program. I didn't know that. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, wow. Uh, which was not my intention at all when I came to Ann Arbor. I ended up working in a field that I disliked the most when I was studying economics in Rotterdam, something that is completely due to him. As he said at his Festriff conference, he liked to steer people in certain directions, and that certainly applied to me. He was a fantastic mentor. I still remember getting my first essay back in the first class I took with him, covered in a mass of red ink. Many of us have been there. Uh, he had essentially rewritten it, even though he gave me an A for it. The red ink coverage ratio diminished over time as I learned to write, which is something else that I owe to him. Another thing I learned from him was to look at data and get a good sense of orders of magnitude and the stylized facts, something that I now find myself doing with students. Anyway, many good memories. Best, Bernard. Okay, another video. The last one, actually. Uh, we just, this, as I said, came in within the last hour. Well, now it's two hours. Uh, for, and you'll hear who these people are. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I know that all of you have gathered in Ann Arbor to, for the memorial meeting of Professor Robert Stern. I wish I could have been there, but I am not able to. I am joining all of you and Bob's family, both Carolyn and Everett, to convey our message of condolence. This message of condolence comes from the heart of a family. Bob Stern was, and Bob and Lucetta both were very attached to our family. My Relationship with Bob and Alan Deardorff started in 1993 when Bob and Lucetta visited India for the first time when I met with them. Both of them were very nice to all of us and my family. And in 1994, our professional relationship started when I visited Ann Arbor. I am thankful to Professor Bob Stern and Lucetta for the love and affection that they gave to me while I was visiting Ann Arbor. Professor Alan Deardorff has also been my guide and mentor in, in the effort of creating a CGE model for India. I am speaking partly on professional matter where both Professor Robert Stern and Professor Alan Deardorff got together with us at the National Council of Applied Economic Research and together we wrote a model for India, a computable general equilibrium model for India which is still being used, still in use. I am extremely thankful to you Professor Stern uh, for giving us this opportunity of getting uh, together and uh, and, and cooperating with us in making in, in National Council of Applied Economic Research a partner with University of Michigan. I have very fond memories about Bob and Lucetta because during 1994 to 1999 or 2000, they visited us about six to seven times and I also almost visited the same number of times. Uh, both of them very fond of India and what an angelic smile on Bob's face you could always see. 
we as a family have been very attached to bob and lucetta and hence we are very so sorry and pained to know of this irreparable loss to the community of economists to the family of bob bob stern both carolyn and everett so i would like to convey my sincere message of condolence and grant and and pray to the god that the departed soul may rest in eternal peace my wife sangeeta also joins me and my son rajat who has been very friendly with both bob and bob and lucetta would also like to say a few words and bob was very close to my daughter who would appear because we are not able to fit in the frame but uh, rajat if you have to say anything he can please lakshita lakshita please come you can in one of the pictures in one of the pictures that will be displayed you can see bob stern holding lakshita when she was just a year old a when she was a kid and she is now grown up and she also joins us in saying in conveying our message of condolences uh, i fondly i fondly remember my whenever i met uncle bob he was he had a smile on his face always and i have fond memories of visiting michigan with my dad and we had a great time and aunt roseta they were just like my uncle and aunt and i i really miss him a lot i miss it both of them and of course i am very sad to know about uncle bob at the at the end once again i would like to convey my condolence to carolyn and everett and i know how attached uh, professor allen deardorff you were or you have been to professor robert stern i know it's a painful time but i think we can all make the best out of it um with the pledge that let's learn a lot from his professional and human qualities thank you very much thank you thank you and in india as we say namaste rest in peace namaste and finally barber pipe Hi, it's kind of hard to be the last speaker. I feel a little bit time pressure, but anyway, I'm hoping that I don't take too much time. So I'm also a former student of Bob's. It was at the master's degree level. Um, however, I first encountered Bob as an undergraduate student in an international economics and trade class with him. And I say encountered as opposed to met because I think I didn't say a word in the class for the entire semester. Um, I didn't introduce my class myself. I didn't uh, ever go to his office hours. So in retrospect, I sort of regret that now. But I made up for it when I became an IPS student uh, later. My first real meeting with him was in a graduate seminar class on trade policy, and I'll never forget that class because there were only about ten of us in it. And I think Bernard might have been in there too. I can't remember, but it was a very small class. The first day, Bob walks in and says, "You know, hi, I'm Bob Stern." Somebody raised their hand with a question. Professor Stern, he said, "No, no, I'm Bob," and that really floored me because in that undergraduate class, he was Professor Stern. So to suddenly have Bob in the room was was quite interesting. And I think, uh, and the, the the very second class, he came in and invited us all to his house for dinner that night. So poor Lucetta had to order Rajarani, I think, or some kind of Indian food. <laughs> I don't think she was expecting us, but he showed up with ten students <laughs> that evening. So. Um, in January of 1985, which was my final semester in IPS, Bob asked me what I was going to do when I graduated. And I said that I didn't know, but in my head I was thinking, well, I'll probably go back to Washington DC, I'll go to the Export Import Bank, which is where I had had my internship, or maybe I'll go to intelligence and research at the State Department, um, because I was also focusing on Eastern Europe and the planned economies at that time. But he told me, um, without my saying anything, that he had a good opportunity for me, or a good idea. Um, so I told Alan I wanted to speak because Bob got me my first job, and he really did get me my first job. So 
One of his former students um, from a few years earlier was a man by the name of Paul McGonigal. He was a mid-career foreign service officer who had taken a break to do a master's degree here at Michigan under Bob. Um, I think he went back to the Foreign Service only for a year or two and then decided to take a job with the First National Bank of Chicago running their country risk management division. Um, I think that after the debt crisis in developing countries, all banks decided that they needed to understand the countries where they were lending a lot better. Um, so Paul was in need of an Eastern European economist and he reached out to Bob immediately. There were three of us at IPS who also were interested in Eastern Europe and studying Eastern Europe. It was Betty Symington, Michael Blackman, and myself, and I'm really proud that I remember their names because I haven't <laughs> kept in touch, but it shows how meaningful this was to me. There were three of us. Bob didn't discriminate. He recommended all of us. He encouraged all of us to apply. Um, I don't know if Betty and Michael applied because I think they really wanted to go into the government, but um, you know, Bob kept talking about how wonderful Chicago was, I think because he had lived there for a while and had studied there. Lucetta also really liked Chicago, or at least that's the way they were talking at that time. So I decided to apply, um, and eventually I got the offer. When I received the offer, um, I realized that the salary was going to be twice as high as the export-import salary in Washington. Um, so I decided to take the job. So Bob did get me my first job, and for that I'm forever grateful. Um, we lost touch for a few years while I was living first in Chicago and then later in Europe. I spent 12 years in Europe working still for First Chicago, which became J.P. Morgan Chase, um, also the OECD and Banco Santander. Um, it was sort of still the pre-email time, so it was harder to stay in touch with people, and I don't know. I didn't do a very good job. But anyway, we reconnected when I moved back to Ann Arbor in 2000. Um, since then, Bob had become a very close friend, a colleague, a collaborator, and even a confidant. Um, we organized a conference together on the WTO, which I think was pretty successful. Um, he offered me the opportunity to do some editing on those books uh, that Alan showed earlier. And um, we also worked on a World Bank-funded consulting project to assess the economic impact of the WTO accession on the financial sector of Ethiopia. Um, what I admired most about Bob in the years that I knew him was his open-mindedness, his creativity and problem-solving ability, his fierce independence, and his incredible work ethic. I mean, this guy was just working all the time, and he enjoyed every minute of it, too. It wasn't hard for him ever or uncomfortable for him. He just really uh, had a smile on his face, and I loved seeing that. Um, working at the University of Michigan has not always been easy for me over the past 15 years. I think I'm kind of a strange animal because I don't fit into the academic mold and I don't really fit into the administrative mold either. Um, Bob always encouraged me though not to worry about that and to keep on doing what I was doing and to do it as well as possible. He always suggested um, that I do what I think is right for my programs and not to worry about the consequences. Does that sound familiar? or sound like Bob. <laughs> I think academia needs more people like Bob Stern, and I'm thankful to have known him and to have had him as a friend and mentor. Okay, that's all of the people who had told me in advance that they wanted to speak, but uh, I'd be happy to hear from anybody else who would like to say anything. John. You come up here so that, so that you'll get. Okay, uh, thanks. Yes. Thank um, hi, my name is Chong Xiang, and I'm an economics professor at Purdue. So I got my degree. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Okay. So I got my degree from Michigan, and my area is international trade. Now, I did not take a class uh, from Bob, um, and Bob was not on my thesis committee. Uh, still, I learned a lot from from Bob, and I benefited a lot from his presence, as I explained below. So when I started graduate school in 1997, a long time ago, I did not know much about economics. The economics papers I read can be counted using my two hands, and I knew nothing about doing research. Then, of course, in my second year, uh, Bob and Alan hired me as the RRA, the research assistant, uh, a slave. Uh, to, to, to work on building a model to 
forecast U.S. trade in services.、Um, so I had weekly meetings with Bob and Ellen, and also with Sarah Hymans. I learned a lot from from those guys, and economic research was no longer a mystery to me.、Uh, in addition, Bob and Ellen were very resourceful, and they secured an office for me in the second floor of Lodge Hall, which was the home building of the economics department at that time.、Um, Well, as it turns out, that was a big boost to my self-esteem because all the other graduate students had their offices in the first floor. <laughs> so, for the first time in my life, I felt my future career would take a path like that. <laughs> Later, I heard that Bob had a tragic car accident, which made it difficult for him to to walk.、Uh, to my great surprise, I still saw him a lot around the department. He would carry a walking stick and walking aid, and he would take small steps and he would walk slowly. I would say hi, and he would say hi, and he would always he would always smile.、Uh, no grimace, no frowning, always that smile. The smile that said he was happy, and he enjoyed every everything he had. So this is the picture I have in my mind when I think about Bob. When I close my eyes. Uh, gray hair, walking stick, taking small steps, and walking slowly, and wearing the most genuine and warm smile on his face. And he would always keep going, always moving forward, too happy, too happy to stop. So Caroline and Everett,、uh, please accept my condolences. When Bob passed, he lost a great father, and the economics profession lost a great pioneer. But I assure you, his legacy stays in our profession, in me, and in other former students and colleagues.、Uh, he always lives in our minds and in our hearts. You may think being on the second floor isn't that big a deal, but since the first floor would tend to flood, even though we had a new building, <laughs> not not new.、Uh, anyway. Sir. You have something to say to you, young fella? I'm younger than you. I know. <laughs> Actually, this is a pretty good room for being younger than.、Um, so、uh, I'm Paul Courant.、Uh, I was a friend of Bob's and Lucetta's. I never worked with Bob, um, uh, and um,、uh, although I knew that there was this.、Um, Machine that produced papers and books and papers and books,、um, and、uh, that said "Dear Dorf and Stern" on them. And indeed,、um, when Alan says he never raised any of his own money, that is completely true.、Um, Bob, Bob really did it all. I just want to have a moment to remember how much fun he was, right? And I mean, really,、um, party, party fun. Right, there were great parties at the Sterns. Lucetta, of course, was a spectacularly gifted dancer. Um, to all of rock and roll,、um, and Bob just enjoyed the scene and the laughter and people having a good time. There was lots to drink, lots to eat. People smoked cigarettes in those days. People smoked all kinds of things in those days,、uh, and it was it was、um, there were really good times that he enjoyed very much. And I'm remembering some birthday party of his, maybe 50, maybe 60, you know. All of those young ages look young to me,、uh, in which Lucetta produced a Venn diagram. Anybody else remember this? And it was boring, interesting, and then the intersection of boring and interesting was Bob.、Uh, <laughs> and somehow that has stayed with me all these years. I actually never found Bob to be that boring,、uh, but you know he was he was the stunt. The stolid one compared to Lucetta, for sure. And anyhow, that conveyed years of very good times, and I just wanted people to remember that. Well, I want to sort of second Paul's remarks. I got to know Bob because I had the office across from him. And because he and I had houses in Wellfleet, Massachusetts, and so at some point, Usetta said, "Mary, why don't you invite us over to your house?" <laughs> and I thought, "Who is Usetta?"
<laughs> but um, and it turned out it was Bob's wife. Um, Bob, I just, when I think of Bob, I think of Vucetta because the first thing I thought was, there's this quiet person across the hall from me who seems to, as Paul says, do accomplish a huge amount. And uh, I never quite, I uh, thought, he must be rather boring. You know, was my main feeling. And then I had dinner with him and Lucetta, and Lucetta was just a hot ticket. She is the funniest woman. My kids who were there who were, who were saying, we have to go out to dinner with people who are even older than you. And I said, yes, to the justers. And I think, Barbara, you were there. And Bob and Lucetta. And I came back and I said, we love Lucetta. Lucetta um, used rather salty language and expressed her opinions quite um, bluntly. And I said, this woman is cool, Mom. And then we got to know Bob and Lucetta, and we, we realized every time we went to Japanese movies, they were there. Every time we went to something sort of risque movie-wise, they were there. <laughs> um, they, Lucetta told us, by the way, the story about the butcher. Bob's father was a butcher. He went to get his MBA so he could go back in Chicago, so he'd back and be a butcher. Um, my story was a little different than the one someone else gave. Uh, Lucetta said, I told him I wouldn't marry him if he became a butcher. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I think we have Lucetta to thank for this. But Bob, they just knew how to have fun. Every time there was a dance party at the Ford School, they were there. Every time... Um, Bob, they invited us over to their house to see some movies. They were always movies I never would have thought of seeing or never had even heard of. And I remember them very fondly. And I don't know if um, uh, Carolyn remembers that. It seems like every time Bob and Lucetta invited me for something, about every other time I arrived the day afterwards. <laughs> and they always invited me in and we spent the evening together, even though I was using the leftovers. And if I, uh, I don't know many people who, <laughs> who would be that forgiving, <laughs> but they did the same to me. <laughs> Want to say a word or two? Jim Hines. Are you even old enough to know these people? <laughs> no. no, I'm not. Oh. Yeah, um, I, I only arrived at Michigan last year, and uh, so I, you know, I, um, uh, I got to know Bob when I arrived at the university uh, 18 years ago, and um, I always found him a lot of fun. We didn't, I'm not sure whether he was retired at that point, and I'm not sure how one would know, actually, whether he was emeritus at that point, but he was always around and he was always a lot of fun. We saw these, you know, former students of Bob's who clearly are very devoted to him. He was no less devoted to his students, and I knew that because uh, there was a period of time when I was director of the PhD program in the economics department, this is about 15 years ago, 9-11 uh, came along during that period. And right after 9-11, people forget this now, the uh, US Immigration and Naturalization Service issued an edict that was basically kicking out of the country non-US citizen PhD students who were beyond a certain number of years in the program. And the director of the PhD program had to be involved, and anyway, it was a complicated mess. Uh, at Michigan, we, you know, tried not to do that. If a student was making progress toward the degree, we didn't want them not to get the degree. But, uh, you know, we have a very large program, and there were some students who uh, basically ran afoul of this new edict, uh, one of whom was a student of Bob's, that Bob had recruited to the university, and um, he was very upset that it was necessary to, you know, basically accede to what the INS was insisting on. Uh, and I was involved and, um, you know, uh, Bob let me know that he didn't think I was doing the, you know, I wasn't doing it right. Um, maybe some of you have had this experience with Bob. That was the first time I had had that experience with him. And uh, anyway, nonetheless, we had to do it. Okay, so that was, two, that was 14 years ago. Um, 
the student went on and left the university without the PhD, wound up getting a PhD somewhere else. I knew that because Bob sent me a digital image of the person's PhD degree. And then Bob has sent me every article, a copy of every article that student has published. And wouldn't you know this guy's actually published a bunch of articles. And so I get, I have been getting, oh, two or three articles a year uh, from Bob that were reprints of the articles that this one-time student of his at Michigan and I know that Bob's passed away now because I haven't gotten an article <laughs> uh, in a short period of time. But, you know, it's, students are devoted to you if you're devoted to the students. And it's really clear he was that kind of guy. Anybody else? Good third. Except <clears throat> possibly for Marina here, I'm the only guy, as I know, from the business school across the street. And when I came on the faculty in the fall of 67, uh, actually physically 68, uh, I learned slowly that uh, this was not only Tappan Street that's or Monroe that separated the two buildings, but deep-seated, uh, let's, let's say, ideological differences are not new. They were there very alive at the time. But I was unaffected by all of this. And the econ department and Alan and Bob needed an outside person to serve with them on the PhD programs. And so I had the pleasure and the privilege of doing probably about 12 to 15 uh, dissertations as the outside member. And I must say, I learned an awful lot from Bob. His unique, and this came through the presentations and I just repeated here, his unique capability of being the nicest guy possible and yet being very distinct and hard on the facts, on the, on the content, that taught me a lesson that served me well for the rest of overall in my career. I was involved in 55 dissertations either at chair or as part of the memory. And sometimes I still read the famous students that I had the pleasure of reading their dissertations and working with Alan and Bleemer and other people were at that time. So it was a very personal thing that I, I was one of the few people before we in the business school hired professional economists who had a good relationship with the econ department. And I went to Bob's uh, conferences and it enriched my career here at Michigan substantially. So I can only chime in what other people said. He's a great man and has in, in affected my career and my life very much. Thank you very much. I see that it is 5.30, so maybe we should, uh, I, I suspect that there's probably more that would like to speak, but I, I suggest we stop now and uh, those who wish, uh, please go outside. There's, I believe, some refreshments waiting for you out there, and we can continue the conversation. Uh, as I said at the start, uh, after that a little bit, uh, anybody who wants to join me and others at the Gourmet Garden Restaurant uh, for dinner uh, is welcome to do so.